This book of Galatians has been really, really a great study, and I hope that uh, in these last few weeks we have in it, and also our last few K groups, um, just have some really robust discussions around um, the things that we're talking about here. And just to remind you, last week we, we talked about how that, um, that Paul says this freedom that we have isn't to indulge the flesh. And um, now he's going to, in greater detail this week, to talk about that. But I, I need you to think about personally uh, the conflict that Paul is going to talk about today, which is the po- conflict within every true Christian, whether they're going to follow God's voice, the Holy Spirit, or they're going to live for their own, um, their own, uh, or I'm sorry, for the Holy Spirit and live for his voice and listen to his voice. And, and I was just thinking about it like a very, very practical illustration of this um, from my own life, and it, it was some time back. Um, but, I, but I thought this was a really, really clear example of how that we have this conflict within us. When I was in, in college, I went home for the summer back to my home state of West Virginia. And back in West Virginia, there, the town I was at, there's very few jobs, so I had to take a job working at McDonald's, and uh, not the funnest job around, but um, I worked at McDonald's, and when we were at McDonald's, when you worked like a full shift, you could get a lunch break, and McDonald's would pay for your lunch or your dinner. And that meal was either, a, it was like a burger, a fries, and a drink, all right? And so you're kind of restricted to that but uh, some of us learned that maybe we could work the system a little bit and, and get more food than what we were uh, offered by the company. And even though this was going on around me, I knew that it was not the right thing to do was to steal money and by stealing food from McDonald's. And how do you justify these things? Think about your own life. I mean, you think, well, you know, McDonald's is this billion-dollar company. They have plenty of money. They're not going to miss, you know, an extra hamburger or whatever, you know. Or, you know, I'm only getting minimum wage, which at the time, believe it or not, was three thirty-five an hour. I don't know if you remember that. Some of you remember way before that, but three thirty-five an hour. And so I'm like, what? You know, getting paid three thirty-five to work here. This is terrible stuff. So, so you begin to make justifications of the things that that, that I did and others had, had done. Well, one day in particular, I, I I went back to the break room and my friend Mike hooked me up with a double quarter pounder and. And the, uh, the double quarter was illegal because you're only allowed to have a regular quarter, not a double. And, and, and so I go back in the break room, I have my meal, and I'm headed back out with my empty tray after my break. And the, another guy's going on break, and, and he said, hey, um, give me a double quarter, uh, give me a double quarter too. And the manager, she, she turned around and she's like, what do you mean a double, another door, double quarter pounder too? She's like, you know you can't have that. Who else had a quarter pounder, double quarter and she's looking around the, the kitchen, and here I'm walking out with my tray, you know, and she looks right at me, and she said, John, did you have a double quarter pounder? And she's kind of positioned here. I'm coming from the break room, and the guy, Mike, who made it for me, he's behind. She can't see him, and he's like, don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> and so I, it literally is one of those moments where just like, Time stands still, and, and, and I probably look pretty goofy because I was, you know, I, I'm not, definitely not good at lying, but I was, I was caught in this moment, and all this was going through my head. You know, these people know that I'm a Christian. You know, I've made that clear, and yet I've been stealing food from the company, and now I'm put on the spot, am I going to lie or tell the truth? And at the moment, I looked at her and I was like, no, I didn't have one. <laughs> and she said, well, if I catch you dead, you're fired. And anyway, at that moment, I, I just really realized that my self-righteousness, and I honestly had taken uh, pride in the fact that, you know, I thought that I w- rarely lied. I mean, I always would say, you know, I don't lie. I don't lie till the truth. And I bold-faced lied. And maybe you can relate to that situation. I, I walked away from it realizing how weak that I really am. And I knew that already, but even more that I, how weak I am. And Paul today is going to talk to us about the flesh and how there's this conflict that goes on with our spirit. And the truth is we're all extremely weak. Maybe we get better at performance. But the truth is we all struggle with our areas and with our weaknesses. And in fact, Paul said in another book, he said, he said that he had, he had this, uh, this infirmity of the flesh or this weakness. We don't know exactly what it was. And he said he prayed for God to remove it. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And he says, I find, I, I find my strength in my weaknesses. And we don't know what he's talking about specifically there. But I could relate to that because in my weaknesses of, of you know, caving into peer pressure or not doing the right thing, I found that, you know, I have to lean into God. And I think the greatest danger for us as Christians is not the fact that we're weak, but it's when we have this superficial belief that we're strong. Because I think Satan has us right where he wants us when we think that we're strong. 
because then we don't need to lean into the, into God and depend upon the Holy Spirit. And we just live our lives by our own strength. And then moments like this happen, which happen more often than not. And we just, we just go with what our flesh says feels right or gets me in the least amount of trouble. And so as we look at Galatians chapter 5, and, and we're going to look at verses, uh, verses uh, starting verse 16 through 26, I want us to really think about our own lives, make this really, really personal for us today. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word that gives us life and gives us truth and gives us hope, God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you put within us, God, to, to, to lead us into truth and to guide us to your word and to allow us to, to be able to implement the words of Jesus into our lives, even as we battle with our flesh and battle with our weaknesses, God. And I pray that today you'll take this passage and you'll really illuminate it into our lives and make it something that truly changes. May today be a day where we truly walk out of here with a greater understanding of the work of your spirit and a greater desire to allow you to work in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in chapter 5, we're verse 16 through 26. Read along with me. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you will not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who, have, who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, along with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So throughout this book, we've talked about the theme being freedom. And freedom in the fact that there's nothing that we can add to Jesus or need to add to Jesus. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. In fact, we said last week that if we do Jesus plus anything, Jesus plus I got to love my neighbor in order for God to accept me. Or Jesus, I have to, in their case, be circumcised, then God will accept me. Jesus plus anything doesn't equal Jesus. And so he says, Paul says, this freedom is found in Christ and in Christ alone. And that's where our freedom comes from. And that's so contrary to all the world religions. All the world religions say that it's based on fear, that if you can work and earn, maybe you'll make it in. And your, your good and your bad will be weighed. Or if you do all these religious things, then maybe you'll get in. And it's a very fear-based way of living. But if we go back to the last few verses of, uh, the, that we looked at last week, verse 13 and 14 of chapter 5, we find what God's purpose for our freedom in Christ is and what our motivation is as Christians. Let's look at 13 and 14. He says in verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So what's he say is the reason that we have this freedom? He says, what should we use this freedom for? He says what? To love to serve out of love to love and serve other people humbly and so this this isn't just a feel good you know okay love because so many times we think love is just an emotion if i if i feel it then i do it but clearly look at verse 14 he says for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command love your neighbor as yourself so he says you know you're called for this freedom to seek uh, the desire and the good of others and you're called to seek it with the same energy that you seek it for yourself. Get that. Get that. Look at it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This freedom that we have gives us a desire to seek and love other people the same way that we seek to please ourselves and love ourselves. And none of us have a problem with that, do we? And, that, and as you think about that, it seems utterly impossible, doesn't it? Utterly impossible that you could wake up in the morning, open your eyes, and say, God, you've called me to love others today the same way that you've caused me to love myself. And that seems pretty, pretty amazing that our concern for others would be equal to our concern for ourselves. 
That seems way beyond my power. Does it seem way beyond your power to live that way? But look what Paul says, the answer to that happening, this freedom, using this freedom to love others humbly and to serve them. He says, so I say, verse 16, walk by the Spirit. And this isn't just another law. This is not just another command just to lay a new burden on our backs. It's what happens freely when we walk by the Spirit is to love others. When we walk by the Spirit, this kind of supernatural love is able to flow out of us. I love this John Piper quote because it really exposes us. He says, People who try to love without relying on God's Spirit always wind up trying to fill their own emptiness rather than sharing their fullness. And I think we're good at that. We're good at, you know what, I got to love and act like I love because this is what I'm supposed to do. Or, you know, I, people have this perception of me, so I've got to show, like, act like I'm loving. And it's really all about us. And love that comes out of the Holy Spirit, it's work in our lives, is something that looks out for the best for others and seeks the good of other people. And look at verse 18. He says this idea of, of, of walking in the Spirit. He says, he calls it being led by the Spirit. And here's, here's oftentimes what we want to do. Uh, Keenan, come up here real quick. You're going to help me with something. Uh, hustle up, man. I was going to do with my, one of my kids, but um, I was going to do one of my kids, but, uh, yeah, but, they, but uh, they're in the children's part, so I have to use you, all right? All right, so here's what we normally want to do. I'll be the Holy Spirit since I'm probably closer to him than you are, okay? All right, and so I'll be the Holy Spirit. You just be a carnal guy who's trying to, to, to live life, all right? Here's the way we normally do, all right? Grab hold of my shirt, all right? Pull me along, all right? Where do you want to go, all right? Over here. All right, so normally what, here's what we do is we say, here's where I want to go, God. Come and bless what I'm doing. Bless the path that I'm taking. And clearly we know that's not being led by the Holy Spirit. Another way that we, we, we do it is we think that being led by the Holy Spirit is, if I'm the Holy Spirit, all right, I'm going this way and you're, you're coming along with me. But that misses what Paul's trying to get at in this passage is the fact that this leading of the Holy Spirit is this empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So a better way to understand and really wrap your mind around this walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit is this, all right? I know you're going to doubt this, but I, I can handle it, all right? Jump up on my back, all right? Oh, my goodness, all right? <laughs> it's this. It, it's this. The Holy Spirit leads. The Holy Spirit leads by the... Do what? <laughs> all right. Are good? Yeah. And so the Holy Spirit leads. Yeah, thank you, Keenan. The Holy Spirit leads, and it's his power. It's not that it removes all responsibility from us. We have to connect to his power, but he does the leading. He does the guiding. And it's through his strength. And that's where this kind of love comes from. That's where this ability to love the way that Paul says that we should love and humbly reach out and, and care for others. It's when we stay connected to the Holy Spirit. And he's our power source. And we need him. And that's the problem, I think, a lot of times is in most of the things in life, we don't really need God that much. All right, I was thinking in the, in the first hour this morning, because especially at the beginning, we had a really sparse crowd, and I was thinking that this was probably a lot like uh, the early church right after the resurrection is these guys were huddled together, and they were realizing, wow, we can't do this. What are we doing? Jesus is gone, and he said he's going to leave us the Holy Spirit, and we haven't got him yet, and we're, and we're scared to death. We don't know what to do next. But fast forward to our day and age, we've got it all figured out, don't we? We have so many books written on how to live the spiritual life. We've got devotion after devotion. I was in the bookstore the other day, and they got Bibles for everything. Did you know that? You know, like the, uh, you know, the, the hard worker's Bible or the, you know, the, the stay-at-home mom's Bible or you know, whatever you want. They got a Bible for it today and with commentary and, how to, you know, and all this stuff. And we've got all these resources, and we've got all the Christian language down and all the theology that we pretty much don't need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we may think of a few examples, a few situations in our life where we really need the Holy Spirit. I want to challenge you that we need the Holy Spirit for everything in our life if we're going to live for His glory. If we can live for ourselves and have a little Holy Spirit falling behind us, but if we truly want to live for His glory, it's got to be complete dependence on Him. I think from my own example, of, I was thinking of some things where I really have to lean into the Holy Spirit <laughs> For, for support and guidance. And I thought, how does that play out then in other areas of my life? One I think of is, 
is in marriage counseling. Uh, as a pastor, I get called on to do marriage counseling from time to time. And the problem with marriage counseling is people don't come to you for marriage counseling you know, when you know, things are pretty good, but they want to make them better, all right? They come for marriage counseling when things are, are terrible and they're like one step from leaving out the door. And so you're, you're in an awful situation with them and there's no trust, it's all deteriorated and falling apart. And those are the situations where I'm sitting here and I'm looking and I'm thinking, I got nothing, you know, I got nothing. And those are the moments where I find myself most relying on God and just praying in my mind, I need you, Holy Spirit, help me. Give me words of wisdom. Give me guidance in this conversation. But that should be our heart all the time. Because Paul doesn't say there's walking in the Spirit, and then there's some middle ground, and then there's walking in the flesh, or living in the flesh. He says it's either walk in the Spirit, or you're in the flesh. And so walking in the Spirit is a dependence upon the Holy Spirit that says, I'm going where you're going. I'm clinging to you. You're my only hope. And that's hard to do in our culture because it's so easy just to go through the motions and live the life. In such a countercultural lifestyle, if we're going to truly live by the fruit of the Spirit, look, verse 22 and 23, he says, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. And again, the Spirit's work is emphasized, not ours. It's not we bear the fruit. It's He bears the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And these qualities aren't things that we can do if we try hard enough. Without the Spirit, it's impossible to live this way. And like I said in the illustration, it's not that our wills aren't involved. We connect to the Holy Spirit. We connect to God. And out of that comes the fruit of our lives. And when the Spirit's at work, these fruits begin to happen. New, motivation, new motivations appear in our life. All of a sudden, we see situations different than we did before, and we become a different person. But I think the, the, the danger in the church is, just like I said, is we've become so good at just faking it. I picked up at Walmart, a couple of apples this morning, and uh, I think the, this one right here, the, the, the nice, pretty, shiny, waxy looking one, is the one oftentimes that we do the best at because Roy Ketch, what's up with that apple? What's up with that apple? It's not real. It's not real. Let's see if I can catch as good as you. It's right. Oh, <laughs> the light. The light was in my eyes. It was the light. <laughs> and this is, this is the way that most of the fruit we produce is like this. It, the end result is it's our efforts and our efforts alone. You know, it, I, I tried to find an organic apple because, unfortunately, uh, most grocery stores don't want apples that have any flaws or deficiencies at all. They want the pretty stuff with the wax and stuff. And so this was the closest I could find. Uh, it was all natural. But, but you look at it, and there's some, there's some flaws on it. It's, it's not near as red and pretty and, and glossy and nice and waxy as this one over here. But what happens? At the end of the day, this one will one day be worthless. But an apple tree, if taken care of, will continue to produce fruit year after year after year after year for many years. And if you bite into this apple and you bite into this one, there's no comparison to which one is real and which one will break your teeth. <laughs> and our lives are so much like this right here. We, we just, we're good at putting on the show and there's no authenticity to our lives. I think that, you know, what sometimes the, the fruit that we produce in our lives, the love and the joy and the things we, show, that we share, they're kind of mixed with our, our weaknesses that it's, it's our attempts through Christ's spirit. But sometimes... Sometimes it's not the prettiest way of showing love. But that's okay because God wants us to be real, not just fake and, and, and going through the motions and pretending. And sometimes the, 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 the joy in situations isn't, oh, I've got joy. It sometimes it's, I've got joy. And I don't really feel a lot of emotional joy at this moment, but I believe you, God, that in this situation that I have joy because I trust that you will provide for me what I need to get through this situation. And so God produces this fruit that comes out in our life. And as we grow in our understanding of his word and, and our relationship with him, and as I said last week, that, that as our sanctification 
is kind of the, the product of really grasping our justification, what Christ has done for us. And as a result of that, we continue to grow and be, produce more fruit and be like him. But what's, what's the problem? Why don't we stay connected to God? Why don't we stay connected so we're producing fruit? Why does that not happen in our lives? Well, Paul says it in verse 16 through 18. It's these desires of the flesh that war inside of us, all of us. Look what he says, verse 16 through 18. So I say, walk in the Spirit, or by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Listen to this, this language. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Do you, do you, if you think back to like passages like Romans 7, 7, if you're familiar with that passage, where talk, Paul talks about his own struggle with, you know, I want to do the things, God, that you want me to do, but I find myself, you know, not doing those things. Maybe you can relate to that, because I sure can. That our hearts, we want to do what's right, but when it comes to execution so many times, we fall short of obeying what our heart wants to do. And Paul says, Man, it's, it's this frustration that exists. And what he's, his frustration is with this, what he calls the flesh. And we're not talking about the stuff that's on our bones here. He's not saying the, the physical versus the spiritual. He's not saying that th this is evil. What he's saying is by the flesh. He's saying this, this humanist, the human standpoint that we have, this ego that drives us to want to fulfill everything that feels good and feels right and seems right to us. That's what Paul is getting at here. And so it kind of strikes me as funny in our culture that people like to say for, as an excuse for the sin, uh, non-believers, I was born this way. Well, yeah, you, you were born that way. We were all born in sin. And that's no excuse before God that you were born a certain way because as like Psalms 51.5 says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So we're wired in our flesh, in our humanness, to look out for us, look out for self, what feels good and what feels right to me. And so flesh is this ego which fills an emptiness and it tries to fill it with something or someone other than God. It tries to fill this emptiness. And it's funny, isn't it? The things that our ego can attach itself to that we all of a sudden find our significance. I mean, it's obvious things, maybe like work or relationships, but it's crazy stuff that we can attach our egos to. The kind of car we drive or how nice our yard looks. I mean, it, it, we're, we're just broken people. Even in Christ, we find ourselves so full of the flesh, so much, that we just run from God all the time and, and just, I need to find my significance in this or that. And Paul says, there should be this battle going on. If you've been born again, you've been given the Spirit, you have new life in the Spirit. He tells us back in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, you've been crucified with Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus, you were crucified with Christ. And he says, Paul's language, he says, I no longer live. He says, this ego, this I that just wants to do whatever I want to do and, and please myself and live for myself and find all these things to fill me up. He says, I no longer live, but he says, Christ lives in me. The Holy Spirit is in me. And he says, this life I live in, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But he says, I don't live for myself. God's changed who I am. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creation. I've been moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And if that's happened in your life, there should be a different perspective about us, about you. The perspective should be, you know what, I'm drawn to just live my life any way that I can live it, but at the same time, I know there's this conflict, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me and drawing me to the things that he wants for me, and the things of God, to live for the glory of God. And so we feel this conflict within us, but I think so many times the problem with us is that we don't truly delight and love the holiness of of God the way that God loves his holiness. And we love the things of the flesh so much that we're really not willing to say, you know what, as Paul said, I'm no longer living for me. Because we want it kind of both ways. We want it, hey, I want some Holy Spirit, but you follow me, not me climb up on, on, on you, because I don't like that life. I like a little God 
in my way in life. And Paul says, that's not the way it should be. And then there's just this conditioning. is the fact that we're human and the fact that we're just creatures of habit and, and we're, we're people who just default to ourselves when we wake up in the morning if we don't say, like I said in, in, the, in the marriage counseling situation where I realize I have nothing to give, is I need you. I need you, God. I need you, Holy Spirit. Our default in the morning we wake up isn't, God, I need you this day. Our default is, I'm going to do the stuff I always do and go through the motions, and you're just going to repeat the same stuff that you continue to do. Um, on the back of our house, we have a, a covered porch, and it was screened in for the, like the, quite a few years ago. We screened it in, and, but un unfortunately, the cats like to climb the screen and, and pull the screen down, and it ended up being a, a bigger headache to keep it uh, where it was supposed to be than, than not, and Michelle decided, you know, let's just pull the screen down. So we, we pulled all the screen down and took it down, and so now it's open, and it looks great, but it was funny. I was standing there one of the first days that we took all that down, and the cats were used to kind of going around, you know, the screen and then coming in the door, and I was sitting there watching and just observing, and when the screen was gone, they just mindlessly didn't just walked along and around and, and back to where, the, to the, where the door was, even though it could just walk right through, you know? And I'm thinking, yeah, cats are supposed to be the smartest animal, you know, or something, you know, they're definitely not smart. And, and, and I'm kind of chuckling, laughing about that. Well, let, let, let's make this real personal here, okay? Um, in the youth house, we've been doing some demolition and construction, Roy and, and Jeremy. Uh, I have a little cubby hole, kind of second office over here. And, and Jeremy decided he wanted this wall open. And you see my door over here? Well, the first few times I go in the front door, what I do, instead of cutting through there, I'm just mindlessly walking around all the way around and walk in the door. And I'm like, I'm no better or smarter than the cats, right? I'm just, I'm just a stupid. And that's what we do in our lives. We just, we just do our routine mindlessly. And it's just this life of just self-pleasure and pleasing ourselves. And we're just like, okay, I'm doing my thing today with no thought of God, no thought of being intentional about our lives, no thought of listening to the Holy Spirit or depending upon this Holy Spirit. And we're just, re we're just programmed just to repeat stupid and stupid and stupid over and over again. And we just keep doing the dumb stuff that we do because we're unwilling to be intentional and have what he talked about, just self-control in order to seek God and, and, and to allow God to lead us the way that he wants us to be, to, to lead us into what he wants us to lead us into. And I can relate to, and maybe hopefully you can too, Romans chapter 8, verse 22 and 23, where Paul, he's talking, he's saying, you know, I long for the day where my faith will be made sight and, the, and, and all of these weaknesses that I have that hold me from really living out to be the person that you want me to be, God. One day, this flesh will be made new. I'll be given a new body that can please you in all ways and every ways. And he, he, he says, he's groaning. Look at the verse in verse uh, 22 and 23. He says, he groans inwardly as he waits for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of his body. Is that your heart's? cry that you're like oh I can't wait till my heart and my actions can be one I can't wait till I can truly be in the spirit all the time and just walk in the spirit and not worry about this flesh but until that moment we're all in the same predicament as Christians we all will have to continue to have this warfare that goes on inside of us and there's only one option besides walking in the spirit and that's walking in the flesh like I said and look what the flesh likes. It says, verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. And, you know, and as we look at this list, here's what we do. You know, because you'll look at this and you're like, uh, you know, not so much me, me there. The thing is, we create, kind of like me with McDonald's, we create these clever tricks in our mind to make it better than what it is in our lives or make, make our sin doesn't seem as bad or justify the things that we're doing that could easily fit onto this list. And, and another thing, this list isn't all inclusive. At the end, Paul makes that clear. So look what he says. The acts of the flesh are obvious. There's sexual immorality, impurity, and this is similar to sexual immorality, but in the re realm of our inner thoughts and, and our expression through our speech and those type of things. Debauchery, just a general lack of restraint. Idolatry, that's what we talked about, attaching our ego to other things other than God. And, and, and idolatry is so, so sneaky and tricky, how that we worship other things more than we worship God. Witchcraft, hatred, the opposite of love, just feelings of ill and, you know, just not liking people because they, don't, they aren't like you or don't do what you think they should do. Discord, 
just an outward expression of hatred, jealousy, being resentful of the success of other people. Maybe you just look at other people and you're like, Ugh, I hate the fact that they have that or they've achieved that. Fits of rage. Maybe you just go into these, you know, lose control at home and, and with your kids and situations instead of pausing and saying, you know what? God, help me to walk in the spirit this moment with my children instead of just going crazy and just letting whatever comes out of my mouth fly. I'm going to pause and, and seek God. God, I need you in this situation so I'll respond correctly. Or how about that married couple who maybe had long ago before they got to the situation where they needed marriage counseling that they had come to the place in the relationship where they said, you know what, I'm not going to react. I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to seek things to be fair in my mind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in the spirit and allow these fruit to come out in my life. And I'm not going to strive for what's mine in this relationship. What would be different? He says factions. That's making up kind of our own doctrines and heresies apart from God's word. Envy, drunkenness, and orgies. And then he says, and the like. He, he shows us this is just not a complete list. It's representative of, of many things that the flesh, the ego wants. And he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. These aren't what God's children look like. People who just can indulge the flesh and have no thought of God and the spirit. The fact that there's a conflict within you and the fact that you know you're weak, that's a good sign. Because it points you to Christ. It points you to the Spirit. And that's where we need to live. That's where we need to, to stay constantly in our lives. So how do we walk in the Spirit? How do we live to serve others in love and not indulge? Let's go back to Galatians 2.20 one more time. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. He's living for himself. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, here it is. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does that mean to live by faith? Well, the scripture is full of examples of what living by faith means. And I can just scratch the surface. I encourage you in your study of the word, hopefully on a regular basis, daily, that, that you identify ways to live by faith. But let me, let me just give you a few as we go through situations, we need the faith to remind us that God is for his glory and also for our good. That things that happen in our lives, instead of seeing them as like, why me? Or how could that happen? Or why did they do that to me? Instead of seeing life that way, see life as if, okay, I have faith, God, that you're working for your glory in this situation and you're working for my good. Romans 8, 28 that things work together for the good of those. It doesn't mean that everything falls in line and your life is easy and perfect. Just the opposite of that. But God gives you perspective. God gives you meaning in those moments. And even though you may have done many things to get you to this point where you've just brought so much self-inflicted pain on yourselves and your relationships, you have to truly believe, as Paul said, he lives this life by faith. I don't live, I'm not living for myself. I'm living by faith in the Son of God. And God, I'm for you, and I'm living for you, and I'm, I want your, your perspective in this situation. Second thing, just faith that these things that we put in the place of God, these idols, these cheap substitutes, we realize that they're going to ultimately leave us empty, and only God can provide real lasting joy. And so practically, what does that look like? It means when you come on situations where, where, where you're confronted with maybe like just like I was at McDonald's, you know what? A double cheeseburger or, or a double quarter is going to give me more happiness. No, God, I have to trust that doing the right thing here will ultimately bring me more joy and will bring more glory to you, and it's for my good. And so you choose by faith to believe in what God says. And so many times we think, you know, faith is just an intellectual thing. But James makes it clear that faith without actions or works is dead. If you truly believe something, right? If, you believe, if I truly believe that this way is better than this way, if I truly believe that, then I'm going to respond this way. 
And so you get in these situations, and it may feel, every impulse in you may be feeling like, this is the way I need to do it, or the way I need to go. And the Holy Spirit says, nope. And you say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you in this situation. Faith is, God and his word are worth the effort. God rewards those who diligently seek after him. And I think so many times in churches, we, we do a great talk of, of, of talking about morality and, and the Bible and all the, the, all the stuff. But so many times our lives are like this because just the very basics, we don't have the discipline in our lives to spend time with God intentionally, daily. And we may, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to really spend time with God this week. And we don't change anything about our routines and our patterns. You know, you got to set your alarm clock if you're going to get up earlier. You're not going to, you know, okay, God, wake me up, all right? You've got to be intentional. You've got to be intentional about it. And so don't just rely upon your instincts because they'll let you down every time. And what happens if we have a church that's full of fake? And what happens, we just, we're in the flesh and we, we're trying to pretend like we're in the spirit and we got all these factions and envy and, and, and selfish ambition, all these things going on. We're like, I don't understand why. Fruit. It's not real fruit. Stay connected to God and his word. Meditating on God's promises. Scripture talks about day and night, we're resting in him and resting in his word. You know, a good indication of when you're not in the word like you should be, you know what happens? You start finding a lot of fault with other people. You start seeing sins in everybody else and seeing all those lousy people out there. I found to be true is when I'm in the word, it doesn't take me long to find the lousy person. This is me. And God begins to work on me. And instead of, if your marriage is rough right now, instead of being like, oh, there, I got this and this and this, you get in the Word and God will begin to show you where the changes need to be made. And He'll take care of what else needs to be taken care of. Take your eyes off others, put them on yourself. And then finally, faith that God speaks and He gives you what you need to take action. God speaks. God illuminates his word. As you're in his word and know his word, throughout the day-to-day -day little things that happen in our lives, the little sacrifices, the little, I'm not going to do that because it makes, it's, it's the thing that I would naturally do, but God, you want me to do this instead. That God leads you on a path and believe that he does speak through his spirit, in his word, through his word. And he gives you the strength to take action on those things, even if they seem hard and difficult, especially if they seem hard or difficult. Because those are the things where God has to show up. So, what about your battle that's going on? Don't run. Know that, that growth, is, growth happens in the battle. That's where you understand that you need God more and more and more. And it's about Him and His glory. It's not about your life. It's not about my life. Walking in the Spirit you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Be led by the Spirit. Remember that example. Keenan, let that stick in our minds today of, of that example. That's what God wants from us. Father God, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. And, and, and uh, we, we can talk a lot about you and talk a lot, a lot about Jesus, but sometimes we get uncomfortable when we start talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that's our power source. And the person of the Holy Spirit who, who lives within us. And God, I pray that the, 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 our lives, as we depend more upon Jesus and as we lean more into Jesus, that as these fruits are produced, they won't be a source of pride, but it'll be something where we just give you the glory for what you're doing and what you're going to do, God. God, wake us up to how our, our natural default is to just to, to, to self -fulfill, uh, fulfill our selfish desires and wants. And help us to see as we go through our day tomorrow that, that we'll, we'll listen, we'll be a, a, aware of your presence, aware of your speaking. And God, help each person here this week to be truly in your word and allowing your word to speak truth and life to them. We pray in Jesus' name.